Mary and Arthur were much interested and wished to see the famous coronet, but I thought it better not to disturb it. Where have you put it? asked Arthur. In my own bureau. Well, I hope to goodness the house won't be burgled during the night, said he. It is locked up, I answered. Oh, any old key will fit that bureau. When I was a youngster, I have opened it myself with the key of the box room cupboard. He often had a wild way of talking, so that I thought very little of what he said. He followed me to my room, however, that night with a very grave face. Look here, Dad, said he, with his eyes cast down. Can you let me have two hundred pounds? No, I cannot, I answered sharply. I have been far too generous of you in money matters. You have been very kind, said he, but I must have this money, or else I can never show my face inside the club again. And a very good thing, too, I cried. Yes, but you would not let me. Yes, but would you not have me leave it a dishonoured man, said he. I could not bear the disgrace. I must raise the money in some way, and if you will not let me have it, then I must try other means. I was very angry, for this was the third demand during the month. You shall not have a farthing from me, I cried, which he bowed and left the room without another word. When he was gone, I unlocked my bureau, made sure that my, made sure that my treasure was safe, and locked it again. Then I started to go round the house to see it was all secure, a duty which I usually leave to Mary, but which I thought it well to perform that night, myself. As I came down the stairs, I saw Mary herself at the side window of the hall, which she closed and fastened as I approached. "'Tell me, Dad,' said she, looking I thought a little disturbed. "'Did you give Lucy, the mate, leave to go out tonight?' "'I certainly did not. She came in just now by the back door.' I have no doubt that she has only been to the side gate to see someone, but I hardly think that it is safe and should be stopped. You must speak to her in the morning, or I will if you prefer it. Are you sure that everything is fastened? Quite sure, Dad. Then good night. I kissed her and went up to my bedroom again, where I was soon asleep. I am endeavouring to tell you everything, Mr. Holmes, which may have any bearings upon the case, but I beg that you will question me upon any point which I do not make clear. On the contrary, your statement is singularly lucid. I came to the part of the story now, in which I should wish to be particularly so. I am not a very heavy sleeper, and the anxiety in my mind tended, no doubt, to make me even less so than usual. About two in the morning, then, I was awakened by some sound in the house. It had ceased here while I was wide awake, but it had left an impression behind it as though a window had gently closed somewhere. I lay listening with all my ears. Suddenly, to my horror, there was a distinct sound of footsteps moving slowly in the next room. I slipped out of bed, all palpitating with fear, and peeped round the corner of my dressing room door. Arthur! I screamed. You villain! You thief! How dare you touch that coronet! The gas was half up as I had left it, and my unhappy boy, dressed only in his shirt and trousers, was standing beside the light, holding the coronet in his hands. He appeared to be wrenching at it, or bending it with all his strength. At my cry he dropped it from his grasp, and turned as pale as death. I snatched it up and examined it. One of the gold corners, with three of the barrels in it, was missing. "'You blackguard!' I shouted, beside myself of rage. "'You have destroyed it! You have dishonoured me for ever! Where are the jewels which you have stolen?' "'Stolen?' he cried. "'Yes, thief!' I roared, shaking him by the shoulder. There are no missing. There cannot be any missing, said he. There are three missing, and you know where they are. Must I call you a liar as well as a thief? Did I not see you trying to tear off another piece? You have called me names enough, said he. I will not stand it any longer. I shall not say another word about this business, since you have chosen to insult me. I will leave your house in the morning and make my own way in the world. You shall leave it in the hands of the police. I cried, half mad with grief and rage. I shall have this matter probed to the bottom. You shall learn nothing from me, said he, with a, with a passion such as I should not have thought was in his nature. If you choose to call the police, let the police find what they can. By this time the whole house was astir, for I had raised my voice in anger. Mary was the first to rush into my room, and at the sight of the coronet and of Arthur's face, she read the whole story, and with a scream fell down senseless on the ground. I sent the housemaid for the police, and put the investigation into their hands at once. When the inspector and constable entered the house, Arthur, who had stood suddenly with his arms folded, 
asked me whether it was my intention to charge him with theft. I answered that it had ceased to be a private matter, but had become a public one, since the ruined coronet was, na was national property. I was determined that the law should have its way in everything. At least, said he, you will not have me arrested at once. It would be to your advantage as well as mine if I might leave the house for five minutes. That you might get away, or perhaps you might conceal what you have stolen, said I. And, I, and then, realising the dreadful position in which I was placed, I implored him to remember not only about my honour, but that of one who was far greater than I was at stake, and that he threatened to raise a scandal which could convulse the nation. He might avert it all if he would tell me what he had done with the three missing stones. "'You may as well face the matter,' said I. "'You have been caught in the act, and no confession could make your guilt more heinous. "'If you but make such reparation as in your power, by telling us where the barrels are, "'all shall be forgiven and forgotten.' "'Keep your forgiveness for those who ask it,' he answered, "'turning away from me with a sneer. "'I saw that it was he was too hard and for any words of mine to influence him. "'There was but one way for it. "'I called in the inspector and gave him into custody.' A search was made not only, only of his person, but of his room, and of every portion of the house where he could possibly conceal the gems. But no trace of them could be found, nor would the wretched boy open his mouth for all their persuasions and threats. This morning he was removed to a cell, and I, after going through all the police formalities, having hurried round to you to implore you to use your skill in unravelling the matter. The police have openly confessed that they can at present make nothing of it. You may go to any expense which you may think necessary. I have already offered a reward of a thousand pounds. My God, what shall I do? I have lost my honour, my gems, and my son in one night. What shall I do? He put a hand on either side of his head and rocked himself to and fro, don't droning to himself like a child whose grief had got beyond words. Sherlock Holmes sat silent for some few minutes, with his brows knitted and his eyes fixed upon the fire. "'Do you receive much company?' he asked. "'None, save my partner with his family, and an occasional friend of Arthur's. Sir George Burnwell has been several times lately. No one else, I think. Do you go out much in society?' "'Arthur does. Mary and I stay at home. We neither of us care for it.' "'That is unusual in a young girl. She is of a quiet nature.' Besides, she is not so very young. She is four and twenty. This matter, from what you say, seems to have been a shock to her also. Terrible. She is even more affected than I. You have, neither of you, any doubt as to your son's guilt. How can we have, when I saw him with my own eyes with the coronet in his head? I hardly consider that a conclusive proof. Was the remainder of the coronet at all injured? Yes, it was twisted. Do you not think, then, that he might have been trying to straighten it? God bless you. You are doing what you can for him and for me. But it is too heavy a task. What was he doing there at all? If his purpose were innocent, why did he not say so? Precisely. And if it were guilty, why did he not invent a lie? His silence appears to me to cut both ways. There are several singular points about the case. What did the police think of the noise which awoke you from your sleep? They considered it might be caused by Arthur's closing his bedroom door. A likely story. As if a man bent on felony would slam his door as so as to wake a household. What do they say, then, of the disappearance of these gems? They are still sounding the planking and probing the furniture in the hope of finding him. Have they thought of looking outside the house? Yes, they have shown extraordinary energy. The whole garden has, been all, has already been minutely examined. Now, my dear sir said Holmes. Is it not obvious to you that now this matter really strikes very much deeper than either you or the police were at first inclined to think? It appeared to you to be a simple case. To me it seems exceedingly complex. Consider what is involved by our theory. You suppose that your son came down from his bed, went at great risk to your dressing room, opened your bureau, took out your coronet, broke off by main force a small portion of it, went off to some place, concealed three gems out of the thirty-nine with such skill that nobody could find them, and then returned with the other thirty-six into the room which he exposed himself to the greatest danger of being discovered. I ask you now, is such a theory tenable? But whatever is there, cried the banker with a gesture of despair. If his motives were innocent, why does he not explain them? 
It is our task to find that out, replied Holmes. So now, if you are pleased, Mr. Holder, we will set off for Streetham together, and devote an hour to glancing a little more closely into details. My friend insisted upon my accompanying them in their expedition, which I was eager enough to do so, for my curiosity and sympathy were deeply stirred by the story to which I, we had listened. I confess that the guilt of the banker's son appeared to be as obvious as it did to his unhappy father, but still I had much faith in Holmes's judgment that I felt that there must be some grounds for hope as long as he was dissatisfied with the accepted explanation. He hardly spoke a word the whole way out to the southern suburb, but sat with his chin upon his breast, and his hat drawn over his eyes, sunk in the deepest thought. Our client appeared to have taken fresh heart at the little glimpse of hope which had been presented to him, and he even broke into a desultory chat with me over his business affairs. A short railway journey and a shorter walk brought us to Fairbank, the modest residence of the great financier. Fairbank was a good-sized square house of white stone, standing back a little from the road. A double carriage sweep with a snow-clad lawn stretched down in front to the two large iron gates which closed the entrance. On the right side was a small wooden thicket, which led into a narrow path between two neat hedges stretching from the road to the kitchen door, forming the tradesman's entrance. On the left ran a lane which led to the stables, and was not itself within the grounds at all, being a public, though little used, thoroughfare. Holmes left us standing at the door and walked slowly all around the house, across the front, down the tradesman's path, and so round by the garden behi behind into the stable lane. So long was the day. Was he that he that Mr. Holder and I went into the dining room and waited by the fire until she he should return? We were sitting there in silence when the door opened and a young lady came in. She was rather above the middle height, slim, with dark hair and eyes, which seemed the darker against the absolute pallor of her skin. I do not think that I have ever seen such deadly paleness in a woman's face. Her lips too were bloodless, but her eyes were flushed with crying. As she swept silently into the room, she impressed me with a greater sense of grief than the banker had done in the morning, and it was the more striking in her, as she was evidently a woman of strong character, with immense capacity for self-restraint. Disregarding my presence, she went straight to her uncle and passed her hand over his head with a sweet, womanly caress. "'You have given orders that Arthur should be liberated, have you not, Dad?' she asked. "'No, no, my girl. The matter must be probed to the bottom.' But I am so sure that he is innocent. You know what women's instincts are. I know that he has done no harm, and that you will be sorry for having acted so harshly. Why is he silent, then, if he is innocent? Who knows? Perhaps he was so angry that you should suspect him. How could I help suspecting him, when I actually saw him with the coronet in his hand? Oh, but he had only picked it up to look at it. Oh, do, do take my word for it, that it is sinister. Do take my word for it that he is innocent. Let the matter drop and say no more. It is dreadful to think that our, of our dear Arthur in prison. I shall never let it drop until the found gems are found. Never, Mary. Your affection for Arthur blinds you as to the awful consequences to me. Far from hushing the thing up, I have brought a gentleman down from London to inquire more deeply into it. This gentleman? She asked, facing round to me. No, his friend. He wished us to leave him alone. He is round in the stable lane now. The stable lane? She raised her dark eyebrows. What can he hope to find there? Uh, this, I suppose, is he. I trust, sir, that you will succeed in proving what I feel sure is the truth, that my cousin Arthur is innocent of this crime. I fully share your opinion, and I trust that we may prove it, returned Holmes, going back to the mat to, no to knock the snow from his shoes. I believe that I have the honour of addressing Miss Mary Holder. Might I ask you a question or two? Pray do so, sir, if it may help to clear this horrible affair up. You heard nothing yourself last night? Nothing, until my uncle here began to speak loudly. I heard that, and I came down. You shut up the windows and doors the night before. Did you fasten all the windows? Yes. Are they all fastened this morning? Yes. You have a maid who has a sweetheart. I think that you remarked to your uncle last night that she had been out to see him. Yes, and she was the girl who waited in the drawing room, and who may, may have heard uncle's remarks about the coronet. I see. You infer that she may have gone out to tell a sweetheart, and that the two may have planned the robbery. 
But what is the good of all these vague theories? cried the 